just a quick preface. Um, whatever is recorded here, I'm going to send to you and Sam first, so you can feel comfortable with any other conversation, anything that goes out. Just you, you don't have to do that. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> whatever I say, I say. <laughs> so, you know. And it will be used against me. <laughs> The, um, the um, uh, Television Academy does these recordings with people, um, you know, people in the business. And they said to me, before they started, they said, you know, and it will not be released until 25 years after your death. Oh, and wow. I, was, I was like, well, that's bullshit. What fun is that? I mean, I want- Can I get a screener at least? <laughs> and they were like, they were like, you do? And I was like, yes, fucking put it online. I don't care, I don't give a shit what you do with it. So, I don't care. Okay. You know, eight years old, what, what could they possibly do to me? <laughs> so, just as a heads up, this is just kind of like questions that I've always wanted to ask people that are, you know, way, way ahead of me in the sense of pursuit of creative expression, art. Um, and maybe when I was a teen, if there were podcasts at that time, that something that I would have liked to have listened to then and maybe gotten a little bit of a heads up from, from people that were ahead of me. So that's kind of where the gist of all this, uh, the questions are going to come from essentially. So cool. Cool. I'll do a little bit of an official intro. So that way, uh, social media, gets to be uh you know brought in and prefaced into it so right. welcome to the artist dojo where we'll be discussing what it means to be an artist in today's world and how one navigates that journey i'm your host afrim jambalai and today's guest is prolific award-winning writer producer creator of oz homicide life on the street uh and saint elsewhere to name a few tom fontana welcome thank you glad to be here yeah Thank you for uh, giving me the chance and being the first official guest of uh, this idea that I wanted to do for a long time. I'm, I'm thrilled to be the first guest. I'm hoping, <laughs> uh, I'm hoping for you the uh, guests get better in quality as it goes on. And my, honestly, it might be a tough, uh, it might be a tough one to, to do, for me at least. Well, you know, I know you can get Cal Bradstreet because he works cheap. Yeah, well... I've also puked in his bushes in college, so uh, he might just as a favor uh, come on and, and, and hang out. So, <laughs> um, but as we were covering a little bit before, you, you're doing well during this kind of unprecedented um, global pandemic slash uh, social consciousness uprising that's happening right now. Yeah, no, it's, I'm, I am, um, knock on wood, healthy. Uh, I am inspired by what's going on i um saddened by some of what's going on um and i am uh oddly hopeful um so um i i'm not i i i i think i think this you know we, you know what's interesting if i could just divert for a second please do yeah i truly believe the election of barack obama would be massive social change in this country, and I was wrong. Uh, I think what happened was that we moved five steps forward, and then we have the current president we have, um, uh, and we've now gone three steps back, but we did still, two, we did advance two steps under Obama. And I think that um, whereas those were uh, smaller steps, I think now we're taking leaps. And um, I, I pray that it continues to be, um, it, it continues, that people continue to be challenged and be better Americans, better global citizens. I agree. I think um, with a lot of these changes, what happens is um, the, the fearful old guard kind of, uh, it goes into a death clutch. Mm -hmm. which happens before change. So I would have to agree with you. I hope that, uh, that that lends to everybody becoming better global citizens and evolving out of it. Well, and being a, an old 60s radical um, a protester, um, I also know we have to be careful uh, not for, for none of us to get singular in our point of view. 
that that the hope my hope comes from the fact that the conversations are happening but if either side shuts down the conversation then we're back uh in in a bad place as far as i can see we have to listen to each other uh some of us have to listen more than others but we all still do have to listen beautiful yeah i agree with you so just to kind of get into it the in the past there was a, a reverence uh and a place for artists storytellers griots tribal elders do you kind of think that that still exists and and with that in mind what do you think it means to be an artist in today's world well to answer the first part um i think that um we will always need storytellers um i think that uh uh the without 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 stories um we become uh robots i think um so until the robots actually start writing <laughs> uh, uh we 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 are we need we need to hear um what uh we need to share a, a, a sense of humanity with each other, and that's what we do through storytelling. Um, the word artist, I always think, is a little dangerous to use, especially for a schmuck like me who works in TV. Um, but, you know, because you think artist, I think Picasso. I think, you know, Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, Tom Fontana. But, um, uh, but I do think... Uh, Get, you know, and, and again, I can only truly right now speak through the, the lens of television, my work in television. I think that um, in some ways it's gotten much better because there's so much uh, room. Uh, there's so many venues. There's so many places for stories to be told. On the other hand, I think it's gotten narrower because um, there is a corporate sensibility, uh, which there always was. I mean, when I started in television, this is how old I am, um, there were only three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS. Fox hadn't come to be yet, and certainly not HBO. And ev even though each of those was part of a corporation, there was a kind of innocence about them, or maybe, I'm, maybe now I'm just, um, being nostalgic, I don't know, but I, I, I mean, I just remember having conversations with, say, for example, Grant Tinker, who ran MTM, which I was working at, and then moved over and ran NBC. And we would have conversations about the work. Um, I, when, when Chris Albrecht was at HBO, we would have conversations about the work. Now, what you get is well, we're really looking for, you know, does it have to be a giraffe? Could it be an alligator? Because we're really looking for alligators. And, um, and I find that, uh, you know, there was, there, was a, there was a time, there have been times and there continue to be times when the executives listen to or trust, I should say, trust the talented uh, people they've hired uh, but it's tricky because so many people in Hollywood are terrified of losing their jobs that they um, they can go corporate very easily. So it's a hard time to be an artist, quote unquote, artist in television. And yet it's also potentially the best time uh, in my 40 some years of being in television. So that's actually kind of an interesting uh, transition to the next question. Um, do you see yourself as an artist, craftsman, both, neither, something else altogether? I think of myself as the luckiest alcoholic in show business. <laughs> um, um, I, I have been very blessed in the course of my career. I, I, uh, I've been very lucky and blessed. And um, uh, all I can say, I cannot, as, as I said, I cannot claim to be an artist. Um, I do think I'm a craftsman, but I also think a craftsman in the sense of um, 
the old world guilds where if you went to a if you went to a a man who made swords he put all of his love and energy in the sword you know um and so you had the best sword he could make at that particular moment um now i think you know craftsmanship is a little bit maybe sloppier in the sense of that people's motivation is less about the quality of the work than it is uh than it is about uh you know, getting the money or, or getting the success, the fame or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and I, I, when I was young, I was as guilty of that as anybody. I wanted the, I wanted the approval. I wanted the recognition. I wanted the, you know, the trophies and the, and the money, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I was a starving playwright before I got into TV. And so, um, uh, so, so I just think I just think that I do think of myself as a craftsman. But maybe if you think about like apprentice, journeyman, uh, master, I think I may have gotten now closer to master than I've ever been in my life. That's beautiful. So yeah, I love the analogy of kind of uh, almost like a blacksmith. You know, mm -hmm. there's apprenticeship. You you pay your dues. You put in your time and you build along that way. I mean, I've always been of the thought that I've found artist to be kind of an icky word too, you know, mm -hmm. as, as an actor. But my hope is that by saying it for myself that I can have kind of a high goalpost that maybe my work as a, as a craftsman within the craft and art of acting would then maybe sometime become perceived as art, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that, the best that for myself I've ever hoped to do is to get as close to telling the truth as I know it, as I can. And if that's being an artist, then uh, maybe, maybe I, I have touched the hem of artistry. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's all I've tried to do uh, in the course of my career is, is try to get to the truth, try to figure out the truth, or at least ask the right question so maybe somebody else would get to the truth. Nice. Was there a specific moment that you realized that this is what you wanted to do with your life, like growing up west side of Buffalo? Uh -huh. Did you think that, and if so, would you mind sharing what that moment was? Well, um, the earliest time I remember writing was uh, my uh, parents took all of us, uh, the kids, to see uh, Alice in Wonderland at, at, at the uh, Studio Arena Theater uh, in Buffalo. And, um, and I was just, it was the first live theater I'd ever seen. I was just awestruck. It was like people, you know, huge rabbits running up and down the aisles. I was like in total like uh, uh, ecstasy. And I remember that night going home and starting to write dialogue, though I have no idea. I had no idea what dialogue was or what, what it was that I was doing, but I was sort of compelled to write stories, uh, you know, to give people, give characters words that seemed like a very cool thing to do. Now I was probably 10 or 11, so you could say, I'm 68 now, you could say I've been writing for 57 years. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, so that, but that is where it sort of started. And it, and it never dawned on me that it was anything other than something I was compelled to do. And, um, and then when I graduated from Buffalo State College, um, I said to my parents, I'm going to New York to be a playwright. And my father said, what's a playwright? <laughs> so there, was, there was sort of a hill to climb, uh, but uh, fortunately they were incredibly supportive of my idiocy. I, I, always, I always think that I was very blessed to be too stupid. I was too stupid to know that I was doing the wrong thing. <laughs> so I had this kind of blind faith and I didn't have the brain to actually go, Tom, this is the worst idea possible, you know? So maybe what's the balance between, do you, does it need to be kind of 100% blind faith, you think? 
or is there some balance there or does it maybe just work different for different people? I, I think it works different for different people. There are, there are uh, to go back to the word artist, there are people who are born artists, I think, like Picasso and Michelangelo. Then the rest of us, me uh, included, especially, um, we, have to, we have to learn how to do it. And so, um, uh, and you also, have to, you also have to be clear about the reason you're doing it. You know, when I talk to a young writer, and they say, well, what do I need to do to succeed in, in the business? I say, well, first you have to decide what the, what the meaning of succeed is. Because uh, somewhere in the Bible, it says we're not called to be successful, we are called to be faithful, which is, in my mind, means faithful to the truth, whatever that truth is. But if your real goal is to write a Marvel movie and make a zillion dollars, I don't condemn that. I think, you know, go for it because why not, you know? Um, but if you have a clear sense of this is why I want to be an actor, this is why I want to be a director, this is why I want to be a writer, um, as opposed to, you know, being pretending that you want to be an artist, but actually wanting to write a Marvel movie or vice versa. I mean, you know, pretending to want writing a Marvel movie and pretending to be an artist. That being said, I mean, again, I'm not condemning Marvel movies. Scott Frank, who wrote um, Logan, uh, I thought was an exceptional, exceptional movie uh, for, for something that had to exist in the Marvel universe. Yeah, I think it seems like your thought is more that don't pretend to do the thing, just do the thing. Do the thing, commit to the thing, live with the thing, love the thing, because that is what your, that is what your mission in life is. And, and, and you can't be embarrassed by one thing or the other. Uh, you know, you just have to, you have to be, be that person, be who you are and, and let the, let it flow out of you. So then that leads me to the next question, which I'll adjust slightly. Um, how do you navigate being a craftsman? in your life and in, in today's world? Like what are some of the things you do to ensure that is happening? Well, I, I, was, um, I went to Canisius High School in Buffalo, so I was trained by the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are all about discipline. And so, um, and again, what they made it very clear that whatever you commit yourself to, you have to be disciplined. So, um, for as long as I can remember, probably since I was about, I don't know, in my teens, I've been getting up at five o'clock in the morning to write every day, sick, hungover, whatever, it doesn't matter. I get up and I write, I write something. Sometimes back in the day, I would just write my name 50 times. Uh, um, the idea wasn't, today I'm gonna write the great American novel, the idea was, I'm just going to be here every day at 5 a.m. and I am going to write. And that is what I'm going to do. That is what my body, my soul, my, my brain are all gonna commit themselves to doing. And what happens over time, at least happened to me, was getting up at five o'clock, which was initially torture, um, became, I didn't, I don't, I haven't had an alarm clock in, I don't, I can't remember how long, uh, the last time I had an alarm clock. Um, I just get up now and, um, and it, it, and my, and my being is ready to write. I don't get up and go, oh God, how do I avoid writing? Which a lot of writers do and that's their process. And I, I, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, but um, I have a friend who, who before he'll start writing, vacuums uh, his house. And I, I, I always thought his wife is the happiest person <laughs> on the planet because every day she has a clean, <laughs> she has a clean house. Um, but I just jump in. I just, I just, I literally jump in. And what's happened over the years, and this is going to sound maybe mystical or something, I don't know, but is um, uh, just before I go to sleep, I, I just identify, I don't really, 
dwell on it, but I just identify the first scene I have to write in the morning. And I would say 75% of the time when I wake up, as I'm waking up, as I'm coming into consciousness, I, the last dream I'm having is the beginning of that scene. Wow. So, so it, 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 and, and that's all because of the discipline of saying, here's what I do when I wake up. Now, I'm not advocating that everybody get up at five o'clock to write because, frankly, the muse would be really over, overworked if, uh, if she had to be everywhere at 5 a.m. Um, but you need to have, a mo if you're going to write, you need to write every day and you need to have a dedicated moment of writing every single day. In the same way that if you're um, if you're an actor, you have to keep working on the on the craft. You have to keep whether you're doing monologues or whether you're doing scene work or whatever. It has to be. It has to be done. Now you wouldn't have to do it every day, but you'd have to work on it every day. In other words, you might be doing a scene in five days with a partner, but in those five days before you do the scene, you better be completely absorbed in the in the material that you're going to be doing on Friday as opposed yeah. to oh it's the night before I should look at it you know what I mean yeah yeah exactly yeah um what motivates you to keep going and and continue walking on this path is there some some deeper motivation is it just like hey I've been doing this <laughs> let's keep doing it or um, I would, you know, Dorothy Parker had the, had the great line that they said, uh, why do you write? And she said, need of money, which I, was a great, was a great line. Um, I would say for myself, um, there is a part of it that I would be terrified to stop writing because I've been doing it so long and it is such a part of my at very texture as a human being. It's, you know, part of my genetic makeup that I don't know what I would do at five o'clock <laughs> because I'd still be waking up. Um, uh, but on the other hand, what I find is, and, and I don't know if this is age or, I, or it's just, you know, living in New York and being exposed to so many stories and, and but I feel like I still have so many stories to tell. And every day I, I, I hear something, I see something, I smell something, and I go, oh man, that, what, what is that? I gotta know what that is. And so, um, so I don't know, I think it's part, I think it's part like fear of what would I do instead? And the sheer joy and, of, of, of the creative process filling me, uh, you know, uh, every time I get a new idea or, a, or, a, or fix a bad idea. So you're feeling that maybe your quote unquote perfect sword is still ahead of you? I do believe that. I absolutely, I've had a, I've had a couple of good swords, uh, <laughs> I, but I have yet to do Excalibur. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you deal with, failures, mistakes, regrets along the, the path of being a craftsman? Well, my, my, my late wife would say there are no regrets. We cannot regret in our lives because we learn from every mistake we make. And I think, um, I think that's so true. So um, in television, there is more chance for failure than there is for success. Uh, and that's on every level, not just not just creating shows, but being being hired as an actor, a director, you know, uh, cinematographer or whatever. Um, there's just so much chance for failure because um, you have to anticipate what a, a large number of people are going to uh, that they're going to be fascinated by this thing that you you're working on. Very hard to do, I think. And anyone who would say, "Oh, I, you know, I know, I know what the public wants," is, pardon my French, completely full of shit. 
because <laughs> none of us know, none of us know. And, and so um, the failures that I've had, and some have been incredible, uh, <laughs> monumental failures. Um, and, and actually in an odd kind of way, I, I mourn for them uh, because because of the potential that was lost, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, with Oz or Borgia or Homicide, I, I really felt like like I I'd finished. You know, I I was done. I was done. I told the story as best I could, but then you make a pilot, uh, or you just simply write a pilot, and they and the, the network rejects it. And you and you go no 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 I have I, uh -huh, on, yeah. I, got, I got all this stuff to do I got figured all this shit out come on come on let me do it let me do it throw me the ball throw me the ball <laughs> uh, so uh, so those are hard because they're like it's like I guess it's like sex being cut off <laughs> you know what I mean you're in the middle of you're in the middle of great sex and then all of a sudden. You, yeah, Fire alarm goes yeah. off. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, contrastly, how do you celebrate victories, accomplishments, good ideas? Well, being from Buffalo, being from an Italian Polish uh, uh, immigrant family uh, from Buffalo, um, the one thing we are taught is uh, never um, get a swelled head about anything you're doing. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you can be you can be proud to a point, but you have to uh, you have to respect the fact. My, my father was a crew coach um, at the West Side Rowing Club, uh, um, uh, and he was an incredible sportsman because in defeat he was he was complimentary, and in success he was gracious, and he always taught us. Uh, whatever it is, whether you win or lose, you have to, you, 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 you to be angry or to be, um, uh, you know, uh, to be, to be jealous, um, was basically uh, counterproductive to the point of what you're doing. If you're going to be an oarsman, be an, be an oarsman. And if you lose, be better the next time. And if you win, try to maintain that. But don't, don't, you know, curse the gods. There's not a lot of God cursing in the fun family, I can say that. <laughs> um, we kind of touched on this, but uh, do you have any daily habits, rituals, and uh, if so, what are they? So I know you have the, the 5 a.m. writing, but do you... Uh... Well, I write longhand, which makes me an anachronism upon an anachronism, because I never actually learned to type on a typewriter. <laughs> so the fact that then the world moved on to computers and I still was sitting there, you know, with Wait, my little I'm pen. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Because my attitude was always, my attitude was always, um, I love when, a, when, a, when something I write stinks. I love the sensation of crumbling it into a ball and heaving it as fucking hard as I can. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, it sort of liberates me. It's like, yeah, no, that bad. That was bad. That's gone. Yeah, that, that, the, the backspace button is is not quite enough for for bad yeah, ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Delete doesn't doesn't actually have the same sort of like incredibly energetic sense of renewal. Like <laughs> blank page, starting again. Gonna be better. Got it. Got it. You know. So what's the inverse of that? When you when you know you've nailed an awesome idea, do you? just kind of like take that yeah. in it's uh, i'll tell you I, I i i am so self-critical um that every once in a while i say okay that that moment that's it you got that the rest of the time i'm always like hmm i'm gonna put this side and i'm gonna come back to it and i'm better it'll be better when i come back to it so and that may be uh, I don't know that. I don't know where that comes from, other than the fact that that uh, 
nothing really is ever finished. I don't think a performance is ever finished. I don't think a, a yeah. script is ever finished. And, um, and that's sort of the joy of what we do because when an insurance salesman, and I'm not pissing on insurance salesmen, but when an insurance salesman sells a, a policy, that's pretty much it, right? There's no more, you're not going like, you know, this policy could be better. You're going like, whoa, I sold the policy, yay. Whereas with us, I think we, we always know that as good as we've tried to be, that, that there is more and more to be explored and more to be, um, uh, you know, just played with, you know? Coffee or tea? Tea. Oh, really? Okay. That's a kind of a surprise for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. I've never liked coffee. And I, uh, every year I have, a gla I have a cup of coffee. And I've had it all over the world in, in the best coffee houses in Turkey and, and Rome. And I just, I just, I love the smell of coffee beans. I hate the taste of coffee. I have to put so much in the coffee to make it palatable for me that it's it's not coffee anymore whereas with tea i don't put anything in the tea it's just it's just the tea all right so now i have to transition to geeking out a little bit because oh. i went down a little bit of a rabbit hole you were talking about marvel and those types of films so there is a contingency of people out there that believe that you actually started the concept of multiverses and universes that are happening. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? I, I, okay. you go. So the, the, the Tommy Westfall universe hypothesis. Yes. Where, pardon my language, where the fuck did you come up with that ending? <laughs> oh, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, well, for, uh, for those who don't know, by the way, just in case, the, the end of St. Elsewhere, there's a, a, a young child, autistic boy, who you come to realize imagined the entirety of the series all the characters within it the world in that series yeah. was a, a expression of his imagination so to speak so okay. in, a, a, uh, in a snow globe that had a uh, the, the 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 hospital in the snow globe yes uh, i'll tell you that i'll tell you this uh bruce paltrow who was my mentor and my rabbi and my friend uh, and really got me into television. He was the executive producer of um, and showrunner of uh, of Saint Elsewhere, and um, we always thought we were going to be canceled because our numbers were terrible. And but we kept getting picked up every year, which surprised us. Anyway, um, we started a thing, the writers, where we would uh, come up with ideas for the last episode because we always thought we were going to be writing the last episode, and we had a a clipboard in the kitchen and then when you've got an idea you write it on this clipboard okay and the years went by and the list got longer and longer and then of course we realized okay this really is the year we're going to get canceled we knew ahead of time so uh john maches who uh was uh, one of the main writers on the show and i go into bruce's office with our clipboard and <laughs> So here are the ideas for the final episode. And we start reading them. There's like maybe 20 of them. Um, and he's like, you know, number one, no. Number two, no. Number three, no. Number three, no. No, 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 no. We get to the last one and it's Tommy Westfall has imagined the entire series uh, in a snow globe. And he took a moment and he went, well, that's the least worst one. <laughs> <laughs> so we wrote it. So we wrote it. And, and had no, I mean, really, we were, the, the thing you have to understand, we were, we were relatively young, you know, uh, late 20s, early 30s, writing this show, you know. And... Um, and we, so we were like bad boys. We were like, wanted to fuck around. That's all we really, we were like, ah, let's do this. That'll make people crazy. So we write this with no idea that it would 
uh, first of all, when the show aired, because back then you actually got fan mail, you actually got yes, yes. bags of mail, right? And so the mail was 50-50 between thinking it was brilliant and thinking we, were, we should be flogged <laughs> hard and feathered. People hated it or they loved it. There was no middle ground. So we were all, okay, ha, 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 the show's over, blah, blah, blah. This Tommy Westfall universe thing evolved over time. And so let me just explain, just in case people don't realize what, what this is. So the, the idea is, and it kind of starts from uh, you over the years had a, a habit, you and I believe Dick Wolf occasionally like exchanged characters from shows. And that was right. really never really happened in other shows maybe um, Six Million Dollar Man or something like that, but those were shows right. that were related to each other. Right, um, right. So then uh, Alfre Woodard right. was playing Dr. Roxanne Turner right. ended up on the Homicide Life on the Street, reprising her right. character in 98. So then that, to the, the people who are thinking, hold on, the Tommy Westfall universe, if she's a character, imagined character within that, then this world has to also be imagined and so on and uh, so forth. And then, and then Hundreds yeah. of shows. Well, it was it was a lot of it had to do with Richard Belser's character Munch. Yes, because he kept appearing, doing little cameos in other TV shows. So it kept getting bigger and bigger. But if you look at the thing, and if you go online, um, you can find this diagram that this fellow did that connects how all these shows connect. And I mean, it goes all the way back to like I Love Lucy. Somehow. It's charted. Transcend you know, space and time. <laughs> where you go, yeah. You go like, wait a minute. Lucille Ball is in Tommy Westball's mind? He wasn't even born when Lucille Ball was on television. But the universe, it's like, it's like stunning. And um, the only show of mine where I haven't done it, well, two shows actually, uh, one was Oz. I, everybody was going like, when are you going to have Munch? When are you going to have Munch coming out? Like, no, this time, not even I'm going to do it. And then Bor Borgia would have been harder to do because of period show. Yeah. Uh, hard to have Tommy Westfall drop in uh, to that. Wow. Thank you so much. That was like, for me, I've been wanting to ask you that for the longest time, just because <laughs> that blew my mind. That made me laugh. And I was like, Tom has to be aware of this happening when did you first find out about that 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 was even a thing well, i think right when when the guy started doing the graph um i think my brother charlie sent it to me and said uh have you seen this and i was of course because you know i don't pay attention to very many things like that and um and i completely blew my mind it completely blew my mind i'll, I'll he definitely also, he, he also my brother charlie also pointed out that there was a website uh, called Why I Hate Tom Fontana. And, <laughs> and the website was people who were pissed off because I had killed off so many characters in so many shows of mine that they would write these, these scathing attacks that how could he have killed off so-and-so? I'm never going to watch another show of his again. Well, then that's, I think that's a high compliment because they yeah. felt compelled enough to, to yelp before it ever existed, you know? That's right, that's right. Um, is there anything else that's, that's coming up that you kind of want to mention or, or talk about a little bit? No, I mean, we're, we're, we're waiting to go back to shooting on City on a Hill, the show I'm doing for Showtime. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, w when that'll happen, I don't know. Uh, and, and Barry Levinson, who's my business partner and I, we have a lot in development. Um, which uh, some of it is closer than other stuff. But, you know, the minute I said to you, yes, uh, you know, uh, Showtime is buying such and such, um, it would never happen. Okay. So that's never to put the curse on, on, on anything. There's like uh, a little baseball superstition kind of a feeling. Yeah, that's that, right. That stuff. But I will say, um, you know, uh, again, I've been very blessed, very lucky to have such great, uh, incredibly talented writers to work with. And it is so thrilling for me to watch them evolve and create their own shows. And, um, you know, of course, none of them call me, but that's okay. I, I, I'm over that, you know. 
Um, no, it really is exciting to see the kind of stuff that um, that pe that people who used to work with me uh, are developing now or have on the air now or the people who are still working here are working on because, um, you know, it's it's there's such great potential still for television. It is still um, this awesome way to tell stories. And I'm so honored to be a part of it and have been a part of it for so long. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait for the next chapter. Nice. I, I want to quickly just say that I find it interesting and I've kind of mentioned it to you. There are these little cosmic nudges or funny moments that happen in life. And um, I told you that when I was 17, I was an extra on Oz. Oh, right. And oh, right. I remember being on set and just like, this is the first thing I'd ever been on. And, you know, uh, uh, Christopher Maloney is just this intense dude and he's walking around and they're, they're playing like Uno and we're in between scenes on lunch and I hold the Uno cards under the table. He's like, don't hold the cards under the table. He's like, <laughs> and I'm this 17 year old kid like, all right, you're walking around. And this is, I never obviously didn't know you, had no idea. Years pass go to Buffalo State College. I'm sitting in the uh, casting hall office, which is a student run production company for the theater there. And you come in as some guy that I don't know. And I think I was a, a little bit of um, just kind of like short with you, you know, I was doing something and you came in and <laughs> asked me a question and I was just like kind of not brushed you off, like not typical of the way I, I would behave towards somebody. And then like maybe a couple hours later, you're there for a master class to like teach the students. I go, oh, dumbass, what did I do? <laughs> and then, well, you know. I probably, I probably came in and asked for something incredibly stupid. Like, why isn't there a huge portrait of me up in this office? Something like that. I, that's my guess of what I said. So then I just, you know, found it interesting that um, you said yes to this and I, I I'm truly honored and appreciative that I get to have the conversation with you. And, and I think I, I find myself really appreciative of those little cosmic nudges, those things that when they happen, if you are aware enough to kind of follow the breadcrumbs, you, you move along with it. So again, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. I really appreciate this. Well, thank you for asking me. And, and uh, I'm excited to see, uh, see the next uh, installment of this. Yeah. I'm hoping that, uh, I can um, ride the, the wave of positivity and get a couple of other really cool people on here. Um, okay. So again, well, if there's anybody you want me to call, let me know. Oh, that's awesome. I'll definitely take you up on that. I'm super appreciative. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom. Bye. Bye.